Hello, everybody. This is Friends in Art Places. I'm Victor Mujadin. And I'm Lorena Williams. And we are here to connect a community of artists through conversations. And today we are speaking to Mr. Anthony Ramirez. Hello, Anthony. Welcome. Hi, Anthony. Hi, um, Victor. Great to see you. Lorena, Likewise. great to meet you. Yeah, I'm excited. Oh, yeah, so am I. This is great. I've been looking forward to it since Victor and I have been talking about it. And uh, it's something we've been planning. And uh, I'm super excited about this. I'm, I'm super excited to be a guest for, for once because I'm, I'm usually a host. So that's, it's, it's a different environment for me. Yeah, right. <laughs> You're on the hot seat now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Hey, hey, right now is a good time to plug in your podcast, man. What's up with the yeah. podcast? Tell us All about right. it. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm a host of a podcast called Academics and Amigos. Um, I'm the creator, the host, the graphic artist, the, the everything for it. Yeah. Um, I'm the producer, all of the above. Um, Makeup so, artist. Uh, uh, everything, everything. <laughs> <laughs> Um, whatever title you want to add to to the creator of it that's what I am um, so you know it's it's a podcast that's dedicated to academics and non-academics alike um, it's where people get to tell their stories and talk about how they got to where they got to whether it's through their education or through um, different going through different obstacles in life um, but they all all have one thing in common in the sense of that they're all doing something what I believe is like really really cool and um, they're all the stories in in their own way are very inspiring too and um, I have a to I have a real great time talking about it and um, and talking to my guests uh, in, in each of the episodes and um, yeah yeah each, they're about an hour long each episode but they're really great conversations that's really cool mm -hmm. yeah. like when you edit them they're like an hour long or like you kind of cut it to like, like it's oh, rare right, that it. i cut any of the content it's super rare um mm -hmm. i usually the only thing i usually like cut is in the beginning where i'm like okay we're recording <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but other than that i hardly ever like cut or edit things because um, I want the conversation to be as transparent and natural as possible. Yeah. Like if you and I were just talking in person, like I want it to seem like a conversation like that, even very though it is. Point. Yeah, exactly. Very mm -hmm. organic. And I want it to seem very genuine too. So usually prior to the, to the episode, I usually talk to my guests for like 10, 15 minutes. And uh, we, we have like just con conversations kind of like what we did right now too, just like catch up with each other and yeah. everything. And um, secrets, that's the secrets of podcasting people. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but but I, I do that to make my, my guests feel comfortable too. And uh, like the way you all just did right now too. So that was really cool. That's when I start recording after that. Because like I said, I want it to be comfortable. I want it to be genuine. I want it to be like if I'm right there talking to you like across from one another. Yeah. Really cool. Yeah, for sure. And especially during this whole pandemic thing. Uh, we we can't have guests like show up with us anymore, dude. So this whole pandemic opened up this window, man, this door to like, hey, let's do it, man. And we could talk to people from across the across the globe, across the nation, and it makes it more accessible, man. That, that's yeah. fun. And I'm glad that's you're fun. doing that stuff. So Anthony, you mentioned that you and I just met. So can you tell me a little bit about your background, where you're from, and what you're doing? Oh, of course, of course, I'd love to. Um, so my full name is Anthony Robert Ramirez. I'm from, I was born and raised in El, pa in El Paso, Texas, um, Texas. Um, I'm a border <laughs> city kid for sure. 915 till I die. Um, and uh, Chico. Chico Town, Chico Town Warrior. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm from there. I, um, I'm a Jefferson High School graduate. If oh anybody, man i know i know uh are, are, are buoy or what school did you know my dad is a buoy graduate oh my grandfather went to buoy my grandpa everybody all right my, yeah, all my mom my, went to buoy yeah. <laughs> all the tios and yeah. the tias and the <laughs> so for me like the buoy and right buoy and jeff rivalry thing was like big um but but like when because i was in marching band but um but like once I got out of that I was like you know what I have a lot of love for Bowie because of my grandparents you know mm -hmm. and so uh it had a, yeah exactly and then the golden bears you know there's there's all <laughs> that history there and so there's a lot of love 
that I have for Boy 2, even though I am a Jefferson Silver Fox. Um, Silver Fox is such a weird term because I think of like, like yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, like anyway, and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So for, for people that are not from El Paso and we're talking about Jefferson and Bowie, oh, yeah. it's two of the oldest schools in our community, mm-hmm. and which is why we're saying the grandpas and the fathers and the went yeah. there because they were, they were the, some of the first schools in, in our community. And not just that, but they're located in an area that is by the border. Mm-hmm. So huge uh, Hispanic community, Mexican American yeah. community. So yeah. lots of culture in those schools. Lots of stories. Oh, from yeah, yeah. A lot of history. A lot of culture yeah. for sure. You got the um, nice talker from Jeff, right? Oh, Eddie Guerrero. Uh, Eddie I like Guerrero. to think Eddie Guerrero over Richard Ramirez. For right. Sure. Yeah. You got to be positive, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, but uh, <laughs> uh, I never thought about that. Yeah. Because it's like everyone always mentions like. <laughs> Richard, I'm like, yo, let's go with Eddie Guerrero. Something a little bit more positive. You know? No, I like that, man. The more positive, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, uh, so, so yeah. But, um, yeah, so I went there. And then after that, I graduated from uh, UTEP. That's where uh, Victor and I had met. Uh, we, we had a couple of classes together. And um, I, I graduated with a um, Bachelor's of uh, Fine Arts in Drawing and a minor in Graphic Design. Mm. And then uh, I, I originally wanted to be an animator. So I don't know if you knew this, Victor, or not. But um, I originally wanted to be an animator. And so my dream in life was to work for Pixar. And so all this is connected to, to what I eventually b- become later. Um, but, and what I'm doing now. But, um, so I originally wanted to work for Pixar. And so after I graduated, I um, went to NMSU to study computer animation. And unfortunately, due to some administrative issues um, with tuition and some other things, I ended up only staying for a semester and I left. So I took about an, uh, another semester off uh, to try to figure out what I want to do. And so I decided to go for a master's in communication. And that's where I met um, a lot of my mentors, like Stacy Sowards, who's now at the University of Texas in Austin. Um, I had I met Dr. Roberto Avantmir, who is a mentor and and um, a very special person to me. Like he he was my thesis advisor, but he was also the person to encourage me to do what I am doing today. Mm-hmm. And what I'm doing today is I'm a PhD student at Texas A&M University. I study um, I, I study Latinx representation or Latino Latina. Um, Hispanic, Chicano, Chicanex, whatever term you want to use, Hispanic um, identity and representation, usually within the border. Um, but I focus on popular culture and media representation in that introspect. So I've done a lot of research on comic books because I'm a huge comic book nerd. So that's where the storytelling and animation aspect comes in. Because I, as a kid, I was a huge comic book nerd. Yeah. And I still am to this day. And <laughs> Um, pop culture has always been something that resonated with me. And so for me, I still wanted to use that background and that love that I grew up with and had since I was a kid to do something with it. And so now I do research on it and I read, I write about it, I critique it. And, um, that's what I'm doing for a living right now. So, yeah. Wow. Uh, let's, let's rewind a little, man. Cause all of a sudden you're like... <laughs> No, no, it's cool. It's cool. Uh, You're there. You're getting a BFA, man. Uh, I knew that you were a graphic designer, but um, I guess uh, I thought you were more graphic designer than drawing, but I didn't realize that you were majoring in drawing and minor in in graphic design. Right. Uh, And then all of a sudden you go to go get your master's and you just switch up and go into communication. Uh, Why that split? Okay. So there's that's a funny story. Um, so a friend of mine did a double, I think it was like a double major type of thing, or he did like something where he combined a drawing and or art, fine art with, um, a communication background, like with filmmaking and Mm. and digital and, um, film editing. And so I thought, okay, I still want to do this animation thing. So I thought, oh, communication, I'll go into communication and do mass communication and, and learn how to do all that. And that's when I met Dr. Sowards. I set up a meeting with her because I emailed her and I was like, hey, Dr. Sowards, I'm really interested in this program. 
um, do you all do this? And she's all like, well, why don't we meet in person? And I can give you f- further detail about it. I'm like, of course, I'd love to. So I finally meet with her and she tells me, well, a master's program is very different from what you're thinking it is. I'm like, okay, what is it? And she goes, it's a lot of reading and writing and uh, it's research. That's what it is. I'm like, oh, okay. She goes, look, um, if you already got accepted into the program, which you did, um, give it a chance, give it a semester. If you like it, cool. If you don't, then hey, it's okay. You can always get out of the program. I'm like, okay. So I, I joined the program and the first semester, I'm like, I like it. It's cool, you know? But in her class, she specifically told me that because I was struggling to figure out what my niche was, you know, and trying to figure out what my research background was going to be and what I want to do. And so I was struggling so much with that. And then I, and I was like, I don't know what I want to do research on. She goes, you could do research on anything. I'm like, anything? She's like, yeah, anything you want. What are you passionate about? And then I told her, I like comic books a lot. And she's like, all right, we'll write about comic books. And so from then on, I started doing research on comic books and fandom. Um, And then now it's moved on to, um, you know, representation and identity. So it's, you know, identity and fandom are still connected, but now I'm doing it more in terms of race. When you say identity, are you talking about the reader or are you talking about the characters? Okay, so my master's focused on the reader. Now I flipped this, the flipped it, and I'm doing research on the characters. Huh. Yeah, so I'm doing I, kind of like both. Yeah, I'm doing both. And right now that you're talking about how you want are studying about Latinx, Hispanics, and comic books, and I'm trying to like rack my brain. Can I name a character, a comic book character, that is of color, that mm-hmm. is Hispanic? And uh, I cannot think of a single Hispanic. And the, there has to be, there has to be, right? And so let me blow your mind for a bit. So okay. DC Comics um, released a character and there's a movie that's going to come out soon um, that they're actually going to start filming soon. This character is from El Paso. And his name is Jaime Reyes and he's the Blue Beetle. And yep. this character is super cool to me because I think one, it's a kid from El Paso, a border city. Two, it's it's uh, it's it's a Mexican American kid, you know. Three, he fights alongside the Justice League with Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman. I'm like, how cool is that, you know, to see somebody like a, a, like like people like us that are Latinos and and Latinas and Latinx and and from our community fighting alongside some of the greatest superheroes in comic books, you know, and just that to me is mind blowing. Um, and so, you know, when I found that out, I was just like, wow, that's super cool. Um, and, when was uh, this character in? Yeah, uh, it's been a while, uh, huh? I've never heard of this. No, no, I, I'm, yeah. I'm shocked. Let's see. I know his first appearance was in. Oh, uh, do do do! I have the comic book with me. I, I have I'm disappointed it in myself. I have it much. some. I have it somewhere in my apartment. Um, but his appearance came out in like um, I think it was like like in like some crisis that they have because dc has like all you know how like the avengers have like end game and all other stuff so it was like um it was one of the crisis series i think it was like 52 or something like that jeez oh, yeah 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 you busted out i'm but, disappointed uh, in myself i, I mean uh, because I, oh man <laughs> comic how books could... comic books are a different world man yeah. they, 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 they can be yeah. they can be they really are. You would think we would, we, and we, I'm talking about people like myself that don't know about this character. Because I, I think El Pasoans are very, very proud of their culture. You oh, know, yeah. those of us that are, are born here and we tend to support El Pasoans that go out there and try and make a name for themselves. I, I feel like that we do. And I, I know I do. I wish I'd known more about this character. I really yeah. do. So the first appearance was Infinite Crisis on issue four as Jaime Reyes and as Blue Beetle is um, Infinite Crisis issue five um, as yeah as Blue Beetle. So yeah, it came out maybe uh, mid mid two thousand thirteen. I want to say two thousand thirteen ish. I could yeah. be I could be wrong, give or take a couple of years, but I know those are the issues for sure. Yeah, it's been a while. I remember when they yeah. came out. I guess when you read the what is it the the, the, what's, the what's up and the paso ink and stuff usually I little yeah right <laughs> uh usually sometimes they always do those little um those little spots and mm-hmm. the blue beetle that's where i ended up um mm-hmm. finding out about that and of course through like myspace and 
and Facebook and stuff. Uh, I guess, man, yeah, that, that's when I started hearing about that. And it's been, it's been a time coming, man. It's been a long yeah. time. Yeah. And, so, and there's plenty of others too. Like, um, like if, if you go into the independent scene of comic books, that's where you'll really dive deep into um, creator own comics that are done by Latinos and Latinas and the people of the Latinx community that are doing like representative work like mm -hmm. on the subject matter of being latino or focusing on latin latinx related topic yeah. you know so like in the mainstream it's it's still kind of lacking in the mainstream you feel yeah yeah it's it, um they're, they're trying in their own way but unfortunately due to like poor sales and stuff these comics get cut short so if, for example like another uh character of colors like cyborg or yeah. um you know who's half machine half man um, but his comic got cut short because of low sales. But a character who's been like super popular, who's Afro Latino, is Miles Morales, um, who's from the Into the Spider Man uh, movie. Yeah. Yeah. So he's Afro Latino. So he's you know I think he's Puerto Rican, uh, half you know half Puerto Rican, and so um, that's pretty cool. Like I think that's a form of representation that that is is needed and yeah. and you know he, of, that, he's one of the few popular ones for sure a lot of kids love that man and i saw a lot of uh, good feedback you know kids that had kids that looked like him you know like they saw yeah. somebody on screen that looked like them and they loved it man and yeah kind of going goes back to uh when i saw rogue one yeah when i saw the diversity in rogue one uh did you get to check that one out lorena a rogue one are we talking about star wars no no we're going to star wars oh you're talking star wars okay yeah, no, i was no gonna worries. say okay uh rogue is, isn't that her name rogue from x-men mm, yeah, yeah that is a character yeah, okay. why well, she's this... like look i represent rogue right there you see <laughs> yeah <laughs> mine's natural too <laughs> <laughs> hey people pay to get that man yeah look it's there right. i don't have to work i don't have to pay for it <laughs> yeah like seeing rogue one when i went to go check it out with my son i felt like i got these chills and like the whole the diversity of mm -hmm. the characters in there is what was lacking in the original star wars man oh. and you had um what is it um yeah you had a couple but that was about it man but you had people with accents man a mexican accent dude and it was fun uh, that, that that was dope you know you got these british accents and stuff already but you know having a mexican accent come out that was pretty yeah. neat I wanted to ask you, uh, uh, when you were younger, you know, did you notice the lack of uh, representation, like in cartoons, comics, like TV shows and movies, or did you end up seeing that later? Like, what, did you ever question that when you were like little? Um, I, I kind of did. It wasn't like one of those things I was like a full critic on. But I was just like, there's times where I'd be like, man, why aren't the characters that look like me that like are a little like more darker skin, like um, like Latino, you know, or why don't they speak Spanglish or do things mm -hmm. like that, you know? And so those are some things I did think about, but it wasn't until I was really older that I really started to pay attention more to it. And that's when I really, really, really started to dive deeper into that and started to question like, why is why isn't there more representation you know, and, um, and those are some things that I've thought about too. And, uh, you know, I really like think about a lot more now than I do, yeah. uh, ever before, but yeah. Um, as a kid, I, you know, I was just like into like all the mainstream characters, like, Oh, Spider-Man, Batman. Um, I was like into the Ninja Turtles and things like that too. Um, but you know, when I started getting older, especially like in high school and once I got into college, that's when it really started to hit me where I was like, wow why aren't their characters more like mexican-american or mexican or latino you know why you know why aren't there characters like that that are like these big name characters why can't batman be a latino why isn't there a batman who is latino you know um so these are things i started to ask myself too and um yeah it's mainly when i got a little bit older when i started to kind of question it a lot more and kind of critique it a lot more are you loading now like when you were younger like did you was there certain shows? Like uh, I'm about to date myself here, okay. Yeah. Uh, I Right away, well, I grew up around the Bugs Bunny era. Yeah. Uh, and I clearly remember seeing Speedy Gonzalez. Oh, yeah. How'd you feel about and, that? Uh, well, as a little kid, 
you don't, right? But he he could only say certain things, which was, you know, yeah. that, that's all he would ever say. And the big hat. Um, I was I was not a critical thinker as a child, but I connected with like, OK, that character is speaking Spanish. Yeah. I, I understood what he was saying, even though there were just a few words. I knew that was Spanish. Um, but that was it. That, and so I thought, OK, then the other cartoon characters are not. Mm-hmm. then Bugs Bunny is white then Tom and Jerry are white then you know and and uh, Speedy Gonzalez is Mexican mm-hmm. and so as a child that's what I felt that's what I understood as because Speedy could speak Spanish then he was Mexican but I didn't think of it as um, I didn't know right we were being stereotyped I didn't realize that that was being stereotyped um, and because I grew up in El Paso around a Mexican family, um, I wish, I think I was, we are shielded quite a bit here in El Paso. Um, especially if we don't leave, if the only t- place you travel as a child is into Mexico and El Paso and Mexico and El Paso, you're not really aware of what's happening outside of our community until you're older and start heading north, right? Start heading east. Then you're like, oh. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Definitely, definitely culture shock. Did it your parents is. ever have a feeling about Speedy Gonzalez when they saw that character there? Did they no. ever say anything? You never caught them saying like, no, because my, and again, times are different, right? Uh, sometimes when we talk about things that happened in the past, we kind of judge them based on what we know of today, right? But I had two working parents, I had mm. two working parents. Uh, and that was what was called, I don't know if it's still called this, a lock key child. Uh, yeah, latch key. Latch key. key, right? Latch key. Yeah. Latch key kids. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, latch key. So it was just me and my brother. And Saturday mornings, my parents slept because they worked all week and they worked long hours. And my brother and I would get up and we had one TV in the house, in the living room. Yeah. And we would serve our cereal and sit in front of the TV and watch cartoons all morning until my dad got up and took control of the TV. <laughs> but yeah. I know growing around here, I grew up without cable. So I had, I had the Mexican channels and the, and the El Paso channels, right? And I, it was almost like half and half. It felt like there was more Spanish channels, man, uh, coming in from Juarez and stuff. And I grew up with um, Chapulín and, Mm-hmm. You know, Chespirito and all that yes. stuff and all the little novellas that my mom my grandma would yeah. watch and all the cartoons that were dubbed in Spanish so I, I got into all that and I remember in high school I started seeing something where I actually drew a little comic I was drawing something and these two guys these two guys are talking to each other and they're talking about two different shows one was talking about Welcome Back Carter and the one of my characters was like, nah, man, he's like, I'd rather watch Chico and the Man. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And the reason yeah. that that character, the one that I made, and he wanted to watch Chico and the Man is because he could rec- he could um, relate more to Chico, and then he can with uh, like a uh, like Barbara, what is his name, Barbarelli or whatever, or <laughs> John Travolta yeah, and all Barbarelli. that and stuff, right? Yeah. So those more, those more. Uh, Relate, they're, they're relatable more to him and stuff. And I saw but, that too. But you know what, Victor? Right now when you said El Chapulín Colorado, Chavo del Ocho, all of these yeah. Mexican characters, right? They, okay, El Chapulín Colorado was a superhero. Yeah. yeah. But he, he had to be funny. Yeah. He couldn't, when we think of American superheroes, we think of Spider-Man, Batman, Strong, sophisticated and Chapulín Colorado was funny it was and, and yeah it was comical was so even in in Mexico right even our superheroes is funny yeah but you I think right? uh the luchadores like with the movies yeah. that they came out with I think they were kind of like superheroes as well because yeah. you saw these dudes oh, yeah. uh, fighting the the mumias they want a huato and stuff and frankenstein and all <laughs> them and the zombies that that actually scared me because i guess the way it was filmed we would watch that stuff on canal cinco, El cinco. And, yes yeah, Mi yeah mascaras. they were like our superheroes kind of yeah. if you think about it yeah know? they really are 
right there masked you know they're sitting there all buff and stuff and well well, well lucha libre buff right <laughs> it's a different buff <laughs> Anthony, do you think kids now like younger kids do they connect so we're talking about lucha libre chavo right. del ocho um i doubt very much that my own kids have the same exposure Ooh, or my a- grandkids yeah. even you know um is that, a, do you think that, do you think it's a good thing that they don't know about Chavo del Ocho or, or Chapulín Colorado and hopefully we can introduce different types of superheroes? Or? That's a, those are really good points and que- that's a really good question too. I think one, um, not just superheroes, but why not introduce them to those like characters in general? Why not introduce them? to the culture why not introduce them to like our heritage and show it how how special it is you know yep. whether it is through lucha libre whether through telenovelas or through food even you know the food yep. has so much history so mm-hmm. much culture and and there's so much that happens within a dining table even within the cooking whether it's yeah. a cookout like like cooking like doing some um carne asada or something like that or a, a breakfast with chilaquiles or menudo or barbacoa or enchiladas tacos whatever it is you know there's so much history that can be found within um food too and not just that too but just in different aspects i think that there are so many different things that we can really look at and be like wow there's so much history within our race within our um, ethnic background within our community because el paso itself is a unique community that oh, is yeah. like any other because I have friends who are like from Los Angeles and, and um, from other um, parts of uh, the United States and from the world too, because I have friends who are international to here at A&M and, you know, they're, they're Latino or Mexican American and, or, or Latinx. And they'll, they'll tell me about their different like backgrounds and stuff. And, and I'm just like, man, El Paso is unique. You know, it's a one of a kind city. And um yeah you know it, it has so much history and so much you it has like a certain uniqueness like, yes, um, it does. you know and it's special like like um i i, I just I, I love el paso like i'm just a person who will like ride and die el paso till i die like um because it's just for me it, it's so special and it has a lot of um special things that uh, it just i don't know i just love el paso and just it's, it's amazing it's it's unique Oh, for sure. um, but referring to like by referring back to the media i think there's different ways that we can look at that too you know um why not introduce our kids to like lucha libre characters and show them like they might think oh this movie's cheesy kind of like the old godzilla movies or something like yeah. that you know but there's you know but still it's a way to bond too i think that's yeah. one of the special things too there's that familyismo aspect where the familism aspect where you know we we connect together because you know, in, in Mexican communities and Latinx communities, family is so important. Mm -hmm. And so why not use these type of moments to connect, whether it's through popular culture and media or through history, food, whatever it might be. Yeah. So you say your thesis is on now you are focusing more on the characters. Yes. So well, what I'm gonna, what I'm planning for my dissertation um, is, uh, what I'm planning for my dissertation is to focus on different forms of media and popular culture that focus with on w- focus within um, the U.S. Mexican border, and to examine the way that these forms of media and popular culture have represented um, Latin or Mexican Americans and um, the U.S. Mexican border in particular. Mm-hmm. So I want to focus on like the Mexicanidad of um, uh, and representation and identity of uh, that that has been represented through these different forms of popular culture. So I plan on focusing on comics for sure because that's for me it's huge. Uh, I want to either, I want to do television or film or and then finally um, focus a chapter on podcasts or music because to me right now podcasts are really big. And there's so much storytelling involved as well. And yeah. in music, it's the same thing. It's like lyrics have some, like ha- tell stories, whether it's like, um, you know, mariachi music, banda. You know, I, ha- I was having a conversation with a friend of mine the other day too. We were just talking about that, how there's so much narrative that can be found within music and the storytelling aspect that it's like folklore. 
that's what it is you know if there are folk tales that we used to tell um and that have now been adapted into songs or that that are songs and you know so i i, I that's what i plan on doing for for my dissertation and i'm excited to get to get to it it'll be a lot of work right? it'll be fun yeah like with songs and podcasts they're all stories you know yeah. people's experiences and sometimes yeah people will turn to music because sometimes they're just that music is going to tell you something that you need at that moment something to comfort you man and mm -hmm. same thing with podcasts you know listening to someone else's struggles someone else's discoveries might help you discover something quicker you know you know sooner than later right yeah and that, that's pretty neat and you're gonna run into it right when you need it for sure yep. why why is it important anthony why is it important uh and I, it's a twofold it's a two-part question why yeah. is it important that we study culture latinx why is it important and have you seen that change here in the United States and maybe even worldwide in the past few years in that push for change? Why and why now? Okay, so I'll answer that first question first. Um, so let's see. Um, why is it important? I think that it's important because representation matters um, yeah. in all fronts, whether it's in art, whether it's in popular culture whether it's in media whether it's history whether whatever it is representation matters and that's for all people of color yes. uh, not just latinos and the latinx community but all people of color because as we can see with like movements like the black lives matter marches and other things like that you know representation and needs, needs oh, granted black lives matter is a totally different um um movement in, in, in its own right but I also think that that it has brought out a sense of representation that that um that needs to be showcased as well you know um but I also think that it has also pushed for a sense of diversity and inclusion and um, e um equity and equality in in those realms as well in terms of race and so I guess I'm answering both in the one question. Yeah, yeah. That's cool. That's cool. <laughs> um, so, I, you know, I think with all these different movements that have been happening and and the way, you know, in a weird way, politics has inter been interjected into that as well. But, you know, we're starting to see how how representation truly does matter, you know, on all fronts of life whether it's through a movement, whether it's through media, whether it's through popular culture, through history, through our food, and, and um, like, uh, like a film like Poco, that showed us how important representation yeah. really is. And um, you can even compare it to another like, film that's very similar, like The Book of Life. And that's another one that, that also discusses very similar themes. And those films were powerful because they really highlighted culture race and representation in a different aspect that wasn't just stereotypical right you know and pride in culture exactly exactly pride in culture with those two movies you had a uh, book of life and you had coco uh, mm -hmm. the people that did coco they try to get an all well like mexican-american cast everything was like mexican-american for the most part and book of life was kind of not that right uh, did you did you feel a difference with that too so here's the thing with that because i even wrote a paper on those two um yeah you uh, talked to me about on, that. on on two on those two uh am i just talking crap or what no 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 <laughs> like, don't get, no 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 no, no. <laughs> we can bash them if you want but i love both of them i love both of them no 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 like all respect to those movies all respect all love uh, like i lost an opportunity i'm just kidding um so <laughs> So what ended up happening with those movies, for example, with The Book of Life, what's cool about that is that the director, and, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, off of the I, I do I not know, know. I know he goes by like Mexa, Mexapolis or something like that. Okay. He's a fame. He, he did wow. like El Tigre and he's done a lot of other um, really right cool on. Mexican American centered um, work, cool. but um, I think it's Jorge Gutierrez. I think that's his uh -huh. name. And then he directed the film. He wrote it and, alongside his wife. Um, and um, who, who helped produce that movie? Guillermo del Toro. 
Oh. Nice. So, right. so that has a lot to do with why there's a lot of these little motifs and a lot of subtleties in there that really resonate with people who understand it. You know, mm-hmm. the Mexicanidad, the Latinidad, the representation, yeah. the identity, the culture. They understand that because of that, and that's the same thing with Coco. Yeah. And so that's the one thing I liked about on um, the Book of Life that in the background behind the camera there was the the people there. You know, and it also had um. Diego Luna too, and Zoe Saldana. Yeah, I might have had Channing Tatum as well. Yeah, I guess I guess that Channing Tatum thing, like Tatum <laughs> thing, stuck. threw me it's off. Stuck. Like, oh, this guy. Stuck. All right, yeah. whatever. Yeah, and uh, and, and yeah, it, it definitely stuck. But I think for the most part, <laughs> most of the cast is um, of uh, of uh, Latinx background in some capacity, uh-huh. minus Channing Tatum. <laughs> Well, we, I guess we don't know, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, not no. that I know of. I don't think he is, but I don't know. He, he we'll, might we'll be Google surprised. Um, in Coco's aspect, so I don't know if you knew about this or not, but prior to the filming of the of Coco, um, Disney tried to trademark yes. Dia yes. de los yes. Muertos. Yes. yes. <laughs> and like the, the, the Latinx community got outrage we were not gonna have that no i like really it's like disney buys everything why do they want to buy our culture and our history so it's like that that in itself is frustrating and so they tried to do that and like one of the guys that critiqued it hardcore was this guy by the name of lalo alcarez who's a famous cartoonist and um he he's from los angeles i believe california for sure um but he was one of the biggest critics of this so disney backed off from this and they're all like nah we don't want to do this we don't want to do this we have chunk class people yeah yeah, yeah. we have chunk class <laughs> ready to throw them. <laughs> uh, you're not invited to the carne asada disney. <laughs> <laughs> and so um what did they end up doing they ended up hiring lalo alcarez to be a special consultant for oh. coco and that's, that's how, move. that was a very smart move right why make yeah. an enemy when you know it's yeah. like disney disney can has the money to do it why not and so one it was smart on disney to do that and two he's a really great consultant not only did he do uh i was gonna say caca but coco, <laughs> <laughs> uh, coco but he did the uh, casa grandes uh which is on nickelodeon right now he's a uh, um so I was trying to combine both those and it ended up being that. <laughs> um, so he's, 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 he's doing the Casa Grandes now on Nickelodeon, which is a spinoff series of some other show of theirs, but it focuses on um, a Latinx family too. So I think that's really cool that he's been able to branch off and do that. But what makes Coco super special is not only that it has people like Lalo Alcarez doing that, but it has other people uh in the background too um i think one of the directors is also um latino as well but even the the music composer is from the border area from the juarez um uh el paso area too he's from that from our the area in our community and so when i read about that i'm like wow that's cool and he did a deep dive into the music of like like the history of what music we should use in the film or they should use in the film not we but um they should use in the film and so there's all this research that went into uh, went involved in terms of like the cultural aspect of how do we represent this in a genuine and authentic type of way even though it's hard to really create genuine and authentic representation in anything really because what is genuine what is authentic um but I can do a whole spiel on this, so you can stop me whenever. Um, but yes, any, um, long story short, um, that's what Disney and, and uh, did. And ironically, now um, both of them are Disney films since Disney ended up buying 20th mm-hmm. Century Fox. So now both both of them are technically um, cousins of each other. So. Yeah. Oh. Wow, that was that was really interesting. Hey, my apologies to the creators of Book of Life <laughs> for not doing my research and knocking it before anything i'm sorry so i'm sorry i learned man i think a lot of us do that stuff when we're young right I'm like no nah, that thing's not whatever and then like dude i just did that as a 40 year old man i was like damn well i mean you were coming from a place of pride of your culture and the book of life is our culture and so why can't we uh, why can't we just own it completely why no, do yeah, yeah, yeah. you know that's where that came from yeah I don't think it came from a bad place. I'm defending Victor. <laughs> <laughs> and what I like, what I like, what we have here is we have like 
three different like generations, man. Of hey, yeah, you know, yeah, people. Wait, wait, wait. I mean, two. I mean, two. Uh, me, me, and Anthony. We're gonna go to a completely different topic. <laughs> <laughs> no, so no. Nah, anyway, I, yeah, I so take I, back my my protecting Victor. <laughs> He, right, can, yeah, no, he can I sink know. by himself. It's all like in our twenties and stuff, right? So. Thank you. <laughs> nah, yeah. So, yeah, we have three different viewpoints for sure. That's, That's better. All I'm say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Growing up, uh, I grew up pretty much Mexican and stuff. Uh, if people don't don't really know, uh, well, my name is Victor Mujerin, right? So you think, all right, Mujerin, right? And then. Um, I grew up mostly Mexican, you know, grew up in Juarez too. And I grew up on Canal 2 and everything. And that's all we did. Later on, I started finding out a little bit more about my father because my mom, my mother would always tell me like, oh, you know, you're 75% Arab and 25% Mexican. I was like, wait, wait a minute. And like, it blew my mind. Like, what do you mean? You know, I'm, I'm growing up like this. I thought I was Mexican all the way pretty much. And I just thought I had my grandfather's... Um, last name and stuff so after a while i started thinking about it i was like oh snap so later on in 2011 i think i'm already what like in my 30s at that time maybe or maybe late 20s late 20s and then another key of my life just blew up uh found out more about my father being a uh, middle eastern and stuff you know from the middle east and around 2011 i started um this uh, this self-discovery thing with uh, being Arab American and accepting myself as Arab American. You know, at first, you know, I was doing the whole, you know, like, you know, Chicano, Mexican American, whatever, grew up in Juarez, whatever. And that's all, that's all really, that's who I thought I really was. And it, it was, it was a, it was a, it was mind blowing. Anywho. So then after a while, I started realizing about my culture and stuff, and I'm still stuck in this middle of, Mexican American, Arab American. I'm like, yo, where am I, man? You know, like, it, it's weird. It's tough. Where was I going with this? I guess I was going with uh, Arab American representation, just like with Mexican American representation. There's a very big lack of it. And if we are represented, we're represented as terrorists or cholos, troublemakers, drug dealers, or whatever, and smugglers, whatever, dude. And that's horrible. Uh, especially after our representation after mm -hmm. September 11th, yeah. mm -hmm. that got ugly. Um, I have a book right here, uh, Arab in America, where this um, um, the art, the the guy is telling the story. Um, he's he's talking to his father after that, and his father is telling him, "Hey, just tell him you're Mexican." I was like, you know, don't don't cause any trouble mm -hmm. for yourself. You know, if anybody wow. asks, tell him you're Mexican, because. I've had people ask me like, Hey, you know, you look like you're from over there. I'm like, what do you mean? I look like from over there. You're like, Oh, you look like one of those people. Like, well, so you, so do you, man. Like, no, nah, I'm Mexican. Like, do you look just as Arab as they do, dude? I'm like, whether you don't realize that or not. And I was like, that, that's a trip. Anywho, I you started, I started going off. About, about the cultures that can't hide their identity. Right. I mean, like Victor was just saying, Oh, just tell them you're Mexican and you'll be okay. But there's cultures that can't hide their identity, no. can't hide their features, their right. skin color, their, um, that's tough. And, and the fact that you have to think that way, that you have to think, I have to hide my identity so I'll be safe. Right. You know, that's terrible. Yeah. It and is. right now, representation is everything uh, yeah. at this moment, you know, for kiddos alike. Uh, one thing that I had mentioned before, I think uh, with, Lo with Lorena and, um, our producer Tanya, shout out Tanya. Um, we were talking about Sanjay and Craig. Mm. You're familiar with that one, right? When yeah, I saw yeah. Sanjay and Craig, I was like, "Yo, like this kid's brown. This guy's Indian, and he doesn't. He's not speaking with a Hindi accent." And mm. like, dude, that's so cool. And but he has his parents. One parent speaks with a Hindi accent. The other one doesn't. Mm. And I'm like, dude, how cool is that? It's like we have our main character here. Uh, he's Indian, Indian American, and you know, that gives me chills when when I know that there's like you know, people re being represented, yeah. and that that's awesome, man. And you know, what I see lately is you know they have let's say sometimes with Disney I've seen like you know or not, I'm not gonna say Disney um, some shows 
they'll have Mexican representation, but like, hey, they'll be like little Mexican kid, but mm-hmm. he'll have like an accent, which you, which in real life he probably doesn't. And then of course he's like a little little mm-hmm. little chubby kid, whatever, and like, all right, you know, and he loves food, and mm-hmm. I've I've seen that, you know, over and over, mm-hmm. like in movies and in shows. And it's a trip, man. It's like when we are represented, it's not even a, in a cool way. I don't know. Yeah, usually, like you mentioned, there are like we or like cartel members, we're like cholos, or you know, um, all these different negative stereotypes. When in reality, there's like a plethora of different forms of representation that they can truly represent to us as, yeah. um, you know, or like even zoot suits or anything like that. You know what I mean? Yeah. And um, yeah. You know, I think the movie that really changed it and was like a huge game changer was um, was La Bamba La with Bamba. Uh, Lou Diamond Phillips. And uh, how was the name of uh, the, the actor who uh, played Morales? his brother? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, ironically, he played a comic book character in a t- TV show, too. So that was like weird connection but um but yeah like la bamba was really a game changer in terms of representation because in the 1980s that's where all these movies started to come out especially like with edward james Olmos, and that's yes. where yeah, things, he was big in the 80s that's where things really started to shift a little bit you know and that's where representation in the like latino front started to happen um and so yeah yeah and also like like you mentioned victor even in terms of like um the middle eastern representations yeah man it's like they're all been there's a lot of representation um that has been negative you know and to see something like like was it sanjay and craig like you mentioned i remember with the little snake and everything yeah um you know that that's that was cool to see something like that you know so for kids like yourself man or, or like when you were little if imagine seeing something like that as a kid and being like man that's cool like you resonate with it resonate you know and that's that's powerful yeah anthony is there hope i like to think so <laughs> I'm a, I, I like is to, there hope <laughs> i like to i like to think so i like to think so lorena because um one i like to be optimistic i like to be optimistic because because if you're not optimistic there's no sense of pr- progression either Right. Because like, how can you progress if there's no sense of hope? Because if you're just going to be like pessimistic and not believe that mm-hmm. there is any hope, then there's not going to be a sense of progression. Because in order to progress, we need to have that hope and a sense, and uh, we need to have communication. We need to have that conversation. We need to have the conversation. Yeah. You know, sometimes these conversations might be extremely difficult, but they need to be done. They need to be had in order to progress forward in ways that we're not you know like the way we were maybe a couple of years ago or even further back you know in order to move up mm-hmm. move forward we need to progress and talk to each other and then through that conversation that's where actions can take place you know whether I it's saw... media oh i'm sorry whether no, no, go ahead. I'm media, sorry. whether it's through media or through any form of action whatsoever you know, whether it's through a movement, whether it's through politics, whether it's through education, art, whatever it might be, yeah. conversation leads to action. I was going to say, and I hope it doesn't come off wrong. Mm-hmm. I'm always kind of timid when I talk about race. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> um, well, let me tell you, I was, I follow a lot of artists on Instagram okay. and I follow a lot of ceramicists on Instagram and so there was this big call for art and there's a ceramicist that I follow she's really big in the ceramic community shows everywhere does workshops uh, hundreds of thousands of followers and she called out the organization she's a white artist and she called out the art uh, the organization because she saw the list of artists that had been accepted into this ex- into the show mm-hmm. and every single artist that had been accepted was white oh wow and she got on uh, live and called out the organization, said she was getting out until she saw a, a better representation of people of color and couldn't believe that at this day and age that they would only select, whether it was conscious or not, you know, only white artists in this exhibition. And what really stuck to me was that's a white artist calling out other white artists. And I think what people need to realize, in my opinion, is that it can't just be people of color talking about culture, 
talking about misrepresentation or underrepresentation, our brothers and sisters that are white need to start uh, speaking up about these issues because without that, I don't think we're moving forward. Exactly. Am I? Am I? Absolutely. Um, <laughs> you know, because uh, I, there, there's a book that I've been listening to and reading called Cast um by um isabel wilkerson i actually have it right here too and it discusses how there's a hierarchy in terms of race and so obviously white is the top of it you know um and then from there there's um i think they mentioned how it was asians and latinos and then um I forgot what was next, but on the bottom, unfortunately, it was uh, blacks, black people, and so um, it, it's sad that it's like that, you know. But the reason I bring that up is because in that hierarchy, you know, since the, you know white people are unfortunately on top in that sense, um, I think that allyship is super important. Mm -hmm. You know, um, if you believe in representation um and and there's allies who are speaking for it in any front whether it's the race whether it's through sexual orientation whether it's through whatever it is you know what i mean um i think that allyship is super important and to have people you know be be helping one another you know i think that's what it's about community is yeah. is, is important you because, call it out. Um, yeah, it definitely uh, affects people in all sense of life. You know, this idea that there's equality and then here's this exhibition, this big show and no people of color, you know, so it whether we understand or think it's an important issue, you know, representation, it does affect our everyday life in the arts and in jobs and in home ownership. And then, you know, we can go yes. on and on. Mm -hmm. For sure. I know. Uh I don't know if you've seen that one interview where David Bowie calls out MTV about mm -hmm. representation. Yeah. And I was like, damn, dude. Yeah. See, you see it, call it out, Fantastic. man. Like, oh, damn. And those are conversations we need to have. You know, they're tough. You know, mm -hmm. right now we're having all these tough conversations where people are like, oh, well, let's say, for instance, Pepe Le Pew, right? Yeah. You know, yeah. it's like, okay, everyone's like, oh, yeah. no, nah, why, why are we canceling them, whatever, dude? But like, hey. Just because we're used to it, we didn't understand it when we were kids. Oh, yeah, that was funny and stuff. But even I had realized later, like, yo, this, this is weird. Like, now that I think about it, you know, this guy's mm -hmm. throwing himself all over this lady, whatever, I mean, this cat, and just thrusting himself on her, whatever, dude. Yeah. I'm like, okay, dude, like, hey, like, right now, hey, go, go do that on the street and see what happens, man. You're going to get yeah. socked in the face and get arrested, whatever, right? But, you know, we're having those conversations, mm -hmm. and they're making people uncomfortable. Yes. They're thinking like, oh, yeah. are we overreacting? I don't know. Hey, there's not that representation in in these movies. Are we overreacting or are we finally calling it out? Right. I don't know, man. So I had that conversation with um my like super close friends of mine. Do you remember Javier Chavarin? Um, no. Chavarin no. would sound like familiar, but no. Yeah, he Probably was, if I saw a face. Yeah, he was in printmaking and in uh in the art uh scene too with us, and he went to school with us around the same time. Um well, Javi and I are still really close. And so shout out to Javi if you listen to this. Shout out. Um, so I was, I was uh, talking with him and a couple of other close friends of mine. And um, we were talking about this cancel culture with Pepe, La Pew, uh, Pepe yeah. Le Pew and also Speedy Gonzalez. Dr. Seuss. I think Dr. some Seuss of the... And, so not all of Dr. Seuss, just a few books, I think. Like, I think four or five books yeah. or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, you know, we were having this conversation about it. And... Um, you know he was telling me like as a father i you know i could see why this is wrong and this and this and i told him yeah man i could see that i could totally see what you mean and how it is wrong it is wrong like saying this but at the same time i don't think we should just fully erase these types of things you know whether they're characters or statues um you know i i don't think that we should like like delete it completely because that doesn't really like take away the problem Right. You know, what we should do instead of um, eradicating is educate. educating, educating. you know, we should educate, we should educate and sh like, why not put, you know, we shouldn't glorify them. We shouldn't glorify these, but we should show them maybe in a museum, not in a glorification type of way, but as an educational type of way and state, what did this person do? Did they do something good? Did they do something bad? You know, in this particular case, you know, we're talking about people who did bad since we're quote unquote canceling them. Right or canceling these characters, yeah. but we should, you know, 
use it as a way to be like, look, what this character do, is doing right now, this isn't good. This isn't the way you should treat women. This isn't the way that you should do things, yeah. you know? You should treat people <laughs> with respect. You should, you know, consent is, is huge, you know? Or, um, you know, whatever the, whatever the situation might be, you know? Because um, I think education would be so much more powerful than just being like, let's cancel it, let's cancel it, right. let's take it away, you know? Because I think that there's lessons that are are there that need to be spoken for and and that way we can learn and progress forward again you know i think there are those there are conversations about why you know certain things are wrong mm -hmm. and i think that some people just refuse to even look at that that conversation but you yeah. know we're going to this canceling of things that are wrong you go into a museum mm -hmm. and we'd have to bring down a whole <laughs> lot of work because uh you know, women in general were either uh, sexualized in paintings, uh, Van Gogh, or in the area of the Impressionists, who did they use as models, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, oh my God, what was his name? The, the oh Lord, I can't believe it escaped me. What do you do? The 13-year-old um, girls that were from, what is it? Was it Galgan or what? No, oh man, I'm so sorry. We're gonna have to edit that out because I can't remember. <laughs> the artist that went over to, um, I think, Poly the Polynesian Islands and married a 13 year old, and then she's all over his paintings. I'm not gonna remember his name. <laughs> the, the thing is, though, that they're everywhere. Yeah, it's they're everywhere. everywhere. We would have to go into the museums and start bringing down paintings left and right. But I think in the same aspect too, it's like we like in our history class, I remember that we would always see all these weird paintings and a lot of it dealt with nudity and, and mm -hmm. body and over sexualization and stuff. But what are we using it for educational purposes? We're not. Right. And we and then I remember in classes, too, they'd be describing like, yeah, it, it's over sexualized and stuff like that, too. You know, it's good to state that because it's like right. it's important to state like this is over sexualized this is you know whatever the situation might be you know but education is so powerful Important. you know yeah. and um you both of you are educators correct yes. yes yeah and i'm in you know i i teach in the um higher education myself and i you know i don't know if it's because i come from a family of educators as well and because of what i do now but i feel like you know it's such a powerful tool that we need to use it in order to create these discussions in order to you know show like history you know because that's what it is this is we're living in history right now with yes. through this cancel culture through these statues through all these different things that are happening in our lives black lives matter etc cetera, etc cetera. we're living through history and so um one day they're going to be in like they always say in the history books and being used for educational purposes and i hope they are used for educational purposes because our kids and our future generations need to know this is important of what what we did right and what we did wrong in order to show let's not make the same mistake again let's show how we can be better yeah, yeah. definitely wow I think, yeah i think the artist you're talking about as well is it this guy right here pablo Gal galgan i think it is no yes right yes yes thank you all right we'll, we'll edit that <laughs> thank yeah, you how much i was like ah this brain, we have not want to talk about age, but ah. Art history, it paid off. Years they're later. all in here. They're in here. <laughs> no, they're all in there. Yeah, for sure. Come up. <laughs> My brain has like got the hamster wheel sometimes. Even for <laughs> I want to. I want to touch on something, and I'm glad that, and I, I totally noticed it earlier when you were you, when you were talking about it. When you, it's like you didn't know what term to use. Mm -hmm. Terms. Was it uh, Latino, Latinx, Chicano, Mexican American? Where are we when it comes to identifying ourselves? You know, what? What? what I'm pretty sure you've gone through that conversation already. Yeah, and reading yeah, up on I, that. It depends on the community. It depends on the region. It depends on so many different factors. There's so many logistics involved in it, and so, um, you know, it depends on who you talk to as well because there's people who um just they're like no i don't like using the x i don't like using or latinos you know or chicanos where the you know and there's other people who are trying to be more accepting and more um open about things and so they use the x for our friends who are non-binary and yeah. so 
uh, to be more inclusive. And so it, it all depends on who you talk to and who, uh, and I've even seen another term use, uh, Latinin. It's with mm-hmm. an E instead of an X. Mm-hmm. So um, again, that is, is for our, our non-binary friends. Um, and so there, there's all these different types of uh, terms and it all depends on who you're, who you're talking to. That, I, I mean, and, and the region and everything like that. Because in El Paso, as far as I remember, like I didn't really use Chicano too much uh, myself. I would say I'm Mexican, Mexican-American um mexican american especially uh, or latino yes. um um I, I don't think i don't remember using hispanic too much either oh hispanic i forgot about that one yeah yeah and that's that's a political term so that that's that that was done because of the census um yeah. and so um yeah it's, it all depends on like like regions too because i know like in california chicano's huge um uh, because I've, I've heard that from people and and some some friends of mine too that they said like in california chicano is huge um and so yeah i guess it all de- it all depends on region and who you talk to so um i just try to use like every term that i can to be as um inclusive with it as possible too you know because i'm not trying to offend anybody when when uh using any of those terms i just try to uh, i'm trying to be inclusive about it and just to show how widespread this community really is uh, yeah, and you, Lorena, now what do you, are you mm, I, identifying I think, yourself with something? You know, growing up, because I grew up in El Paso, and everybody that I knew was like me, I don't think I ever needed to identify myself, because I was around, surrounded by people like me, and yeah. when I went to stay in my grandma's in Mexico, then I, you know, it wasn't until I, I was older that I felt the need that I had to identify myself. But growing up, I didn't feel that need to find my, that I was a certain identity. I didn't, I didn't think I was any different than anybody else until I got older. <laughs> until you got older. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's the thing is like when we're kiddos, we, you know, mm-hmm. we don't see that. We don't see that difference, man. No, you and after a while you do, you're like, Hey, wait a minute. Why am I different than these kiddos or whatever? Or, like it's a trip. Yeah. Yeah. Anthony, wow, this has been really, really a good conversation. I'm enjoying myself. <laughs> oh, go ahead. I'm enjoying it too. Uh, that's yeah, man. Let's um, yeah. Let this. This is a good, good place to end it. Well, we def- we def- be- mm-hmm. before we do, we gotta give him a chance. Oh Edit yeah, out, Tanya. Anthony, <laughs> anything you'd like to add? Um. Well, I just want to thank you all for the, uh, this opportunity to be here, speaking with you both, and. Uh, this was a wonderful conversation, um, and uh, I look forward to carrying on other conversations like this with others in the future. Um, yeah, um, I, I really appreciate the support, Victor. Thank you for being a friend all these years, and wow. Donna, it's awesome meeting you. And I hope awesome we, can, meeting you too. And we can meet in person once all Definitely. this stuff's all over. Um, and um, you know, again, thank you so much for letting me. Um, be here on this platform and just to discuss not only my research but race and all these topics in popular culture that i really love and enjoy um i guess i'll i'll, I'll do my plugs while i'm at it too uh, yeah plug <laughs> yes, yourself definitely. man so, and we're gonna add go your info it. in our website oh cool, cool. cool. people can find you there also <laughs> <laughs> yeah i remember in this one class that that i had here at AM, this guy would always be like Yo, if you got something to plug, plug it, plug it. You'd be like that. Like the way <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, if anybody's ever interested in uh, my research or wanting to know more about me, you can visit my website, www.arramirez.com. Uh, if you want to check out my podcast, Academics on Amigos, it's available on most podcast platforms. Um, if you just want to just listen to it on a browser, you're more than welcome to as well. www.erramirez.com slash Academics and Amigos. Uh, I'm on most uh, platforms as well, uh, in, like social media wise. Just look me up, Anthony R. Ramirez. Um, Instagram, I'm AR. I don't know if there's an underscore there or not, but I know it's AR Ramirez. I think it's AR underscore Ramirez. And then on Twitter, I'm Latinx Acapop. Um, yeah. So that, that's it. If, any, if anybody, oh, no, nah, I don't have a Twitch yet. Yeah, Twitch. <laughs> <laughs> I'm yeah, not we'll, on TikTok. Uh, yeah, either. we'll definitely Discord? add all no, that stuff. Nothing? No, no, none of that. <laughs> uh, Reddit, actually. Reddit. Uh, 
My, are you still well, on my space? Thank you so much. <laughs> a Zanga. Well, let's go. Let's date ourselves even back, even back even more. Let's do Zanga. Live journal. <laughs> but but um, American online. Again, thank you so much for uh, giving me this time to to speak with you all. I had a great time. Thank you. Hey, thank, thank you, you man. We'll talk again. Yeah, All for right. sure. We got to get you back again, man. We got to talk yeah. more stuff. And I want I want you to be um, a recurring guest, man, so we can yes. have more conversations, dude. I appreciate that. And I'd love that. Uh, take care of yourself. Stay Me safe too. and uh, stay healthy. And much love to you both. Likewise. Oh, same way, man. Please, please. Later, later, dude. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for listening to Friends in Art Places. Our guest today was Anthony Ramirez. I'm Victor Mujedin. And I'm Lorena Williams. Don't forget to like us, share us, and follow us. Till next time. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.